Bel, Astaroth, Malthas. From Babylon to Hollywood, tales of evil spirits, demonic possession, and things that go bump in the night have captivated audiences for thousands of years. There are some who practice exorcisms to rid people, places, and things of demonic influence, and still others who treat demons as objects of worship. Demonology, though frightening to some, is not like demonolatry, the worship of demons. It is the study of demons and their worship, and it's what we'll be engaging in today. So what are demons, and why would someone worship them? The remarkable similarities between Christianity and demonolatry may surprise you. Let me take you on a strange journey into the world of Christian demonology. The year is 46 AD, the place Chironia, a small village from Greece. Here is where the famous author Plutarch was born. Eventually, in a work on the decline of the oracles, he proclaimed that the great god Pan was dead. Theologians today believe that his statement was a remark on the rise of Abrahamic religions and the fading away of pagan traditions. But Plutarch might have meant this literally, as he did believe that contact with otherworldly entities was possible, and to do this, he may have had to contact demons. Plutarch tells us that there are holy demons, daimones, guardians of men which interpret and serve being intermediary between gods and men, since they send up above the prayers and requests of men, and they take back down to us revelations and gifts of blessings. Pan, a god of nature, music, wilderness, and overt sexuality, represented everything that the Christian faith deemed unholy. So much so, Christians would adopt aspects of Pan into their visions of the devil. Baphomet, Satan, and various other Christian demons are often depicted with horns and beast-like faces. This image comes from Homer, who described Pan's birth in his hymn to Pan. In the house she bare Hermes a dear son, who from his birth was marvelous to look upon, with goat's feet and two horns, a noisy, merry laughing child. But when the nurse saw his uncouth face and full beard, she was afraid, and sprang up and fled and left the child. The image of Pan doesn't scare off everybody, though. In The Book of Black Magic by Arthur Edward Waite, a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and an author of many pieces of occult literature, the likeness of Baphomet, which is based on Pan, is described almost like an appeal to God. The Sabbatic Goat from The Ritual of Transcendental Magic by Eliphas Levi, who identifies it with the Baphomet of Mendes and does not regard it as connected with black magic, but as a pantheistic and magical figure of the absolute. Early depictions of demons and Satan are more holy than frightening. It seems that while the church adopted the names and the looks of pagan gods, they abandoned all of their good nature, and they also abandoned all of the good looks of the early depictions of Satan. Samael was formerly chief among the angels of God, and now he is prince among devils. His name is derived from Sime, which means to bind and deceive. He stands on the left side of men. He goes by various names, such as the Old Serpent, the Unclean Spirit, Satan, Leviathan, and sometimes also Asael. This image of the devil has no horns, his skin isn't red, and he doesn't look any more menacing than any other angel. Instead, he's a seraphim. The seraphim were powerful angels who sung out God's holiness. Usually they were depicted as either humanoid or beasts, but they would always have six wings each. That's in no way similar to the modern depiction of Satan. His story also depicts Samael as the serpent in the Garden of Eden and shows the fall shortly after the original sin. He was not driven out of heaven until after he had led Adam and Eve into sin. Then Samael and his hosts were precipitated out of the place of bliss, with God's curse to weigh them down. In the struggle between Michael and Samael, the falling seraph caught the wings of Michael and tried to drag him down with him. But God saved him when Mikael derived his name, The Rescued. 
With all of these different ideas represented by demons, it seems appropriate to ask what actually qualifies something as a demon. The literal meaning of the word demon is replete or fill with wisdom. It has its origins in the Greek term daimon, which refers to a deity or any supernatural creature. Nymphs, dryads, leprechauns, and all sorts of entities could be considered daimones. Later, daimon came to Latin as daemonium, referring to any evil or lesser spirit. Modern definitions of the word refer to a demon as an evil spirit, but the word is also synonymous with genius. The genius synonym likely comes from occult manuscripts, which state that demons are capable of teaching important skills. For example, in the Book of the Watchers, the fall of the angels from heaven is detailed after Azazel teaches humans metallurgy. That book is part of the Book of Enoch, an apocryphal text. It appears to be a Jewish parallel to the Prometheus myth. For giving mankind fire, Prometheus was severely punished, and in The Origin of Satan by Elaine Pagels, similar events in the Book of the Watchers are summarized. The Archangel Azazel sinned by disclosing to human beings the secret of metallurgy, a pernicious revelation that inspired men to make weapons and women to adorn themselves with gold, silver, and cosmetics. Thus, the fallen angels and their demon offspring incited in both sexes violence, greed, and lust. With the many possible things that can be referred to as demons, I find Dr. Richard Carrier's definition from On the Historicity of Jesus very appealing. I'll sometimes use demon to refer to gods who are believed to be acting in opposition to God. The terminology was already this fluid even among early Christians, e.g. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, 1 Corinthians 8.5, Galatians 4.8-9. Although I will also use demons more neutrally in the context of pagan belief, in which there were both good and evil demons, all of whom gods. How does a demonic ritual actually work according to demon elders today? Well, after reading through many grimoires, I think that the fundamental method is pretty easy to understand. First of all, modern occultists usually refer to interactions with demons as either evocation or invocation. Invocation is something like a spirit medium, where a person allows themselves to become possessed by a spirit in order to be used for communication or to otherwise gain qualities of that entity. Evocation calls for a demon to go out in the physical world in order to achieve a task, but some grimoires emphasize that they can also be called to physical appearance, either in the real world or in a viewing device such as a black mirror, a seeing stone, pools of water, or anywhere with a reflective surface. For example, when performing Enochian magic, a Christian esoteric system, John Dee would look into a stone as part of a ritual in order to receive messages from angels. Although Enochian magic deals specifically with angels, its fundamental processes are functionally identical to those concerned with demons. Before a ritual begins, there is supposed to be a period of preparation where the demonolater prays for protection and usually follows other standards such as celibacy and purification rituals like ritualistic bathing or fasting. It's also during this time that the aspiring wizard must gather the tools needed to perform a ritual and bless each of them, usually in accordance with various astrological standards and sometimes requiring carving, engravings, chants, and various other smaller practices. Besides tools, various herbs, incenses, candles, and sacrificial goods such as wine, grain, or even live animals would be gathered according to the reported preferences of the demon to be contacted. Then, in a private space, usually outdoors, and at a date and time specific to the demon they want to contact, the demonolater can proceed with their ritual. The actual rituals themselves are pretty lengthy. For example, there's Goetia, a system of demonic evocation from the mid-17th century found in the Lesser Key of Solomon, named after the biblical King Solomon. This was no mistake. According to Josephus, King Solomon was an adept at casting out demons. The main ritual of Goetia requires first an exorcism of every single tool used, as well as the area and the people involved in the act. There are prayers to various angels and the Abrahamic gods several times throughout, 
and then there are at least four more ritual exorcisms. It is only after that point that a practitioner of this system should draw the various symbols for protection, containing a demon on a black mirror, prompt expulsion of a demon from the area, invocations of primordial forces, and a symbol referred to as a seal or sigil which represents the demon itself. It is at that point that the aspiring wizard commands the demon to appearance by the authority of God in order to do their bidding, for which there are more than five lengthy commanding prayers which are supposed to be repeated until the demon appears. Once the ritual is finished, the tools, the people, and the area must once again be exorcised. Exorcism was a major part of demonolatry as well as Christianity. And while it far predates Christianity, it has become a major portion of their theurgy. Demons were the germs of the ancient world. They were assumed to infest the body and cause a myriad of ills. To bring about a cure, the demon must be expelled. The term exorcism comes from the Greek magical term exorcision, which means to conjure out. It is the key formula used to expel demons. The parallels between occult practice and mainstream Christianity are not modern deductions. For many centuries, people have been depicting Jesus as a great wizard or magi and showing his miracles as feats of magic. There were many people claiming to be messiahs or religious icons around the first century that Christians depict as evil wizards or sorcerers, but some early Christian iconography shows Jesus in much the same way. On a sarcophagus to be found in the Museo Gregoriano, which is paneled with bas-reliefs, is said to be seen a representation of Jesus raising Lazarus from the grave. He's represented as a young man, beardless and equipped with a wand in the received guise of a necromancer, whilst the corpse of Lazarus is swathed in bandages exactly as an Egyptian mummy. On other Christian monuments representing the miracles of Jesus, he's pictured in the same manner. For instance, when he's represented as turning the water into wine and multiplying the bread in the wilderness, he is a necromancer with a wand in his hand. This, alongside Jesus' ability to command demons such as legion, makes it clear that the fundamental practices of modern and ancient demonolaters are nearly identical to those of Christians. They both practice exorcism, fasting, water purification rituals, prayers for guidance and protection, and calendar-based special events and also make use of a plethora of holy or unholy objects alongside various pieces of religious iconography. As we've learned so far, demonolatry to Christians is essentially the practice of worshipping foreign gods. But the methods of religious practice in pagan traditions don't differ radically from Christian worship. The ancient Egyptian worship had a great splendor of ritual. There was a morning service, a kind of mass, celebrated by a priest, shorn and beardless, there were sprinklings of holy water, etc., etc. The parallels between Christianity and pagan religions had not gone unnoticed. It may have been necessary for the survival of many pagan civilizations. Rome had control over the entire Mediterranean region, something necessary for trade. When Rome accepted Christianity as a state religion, they chose not to do business with pagan nations. Pagans had to make a choice adopt Christianity, or suffer from trade barriers put into place by Rome. To accomplish this end, certain rituals from paganism were adopted into Christianity. This helped to smooth the transition for many nations, but some Christians were not happy with the outcome. You have substituted your agape for the sacrifices of the pagans, for their idols, your martyrs, whom you serve with the very same honors. You appease the shades of the dead with wine and feasts, you celebrate the solemn festivities of the Gentiles, their calends, and their solstices, and as to their manners, those you have retained without any alteration. Nothing distinguishes you from the pagans, except that you hold your assemblies apart from them. This unease with different religions was culminating within mainstream Christianity for a long time. Eventually, a position was made by the church itself. At first, Christians usually considered devil worship and the summoning of demons to be just mere illusions created by the devil, but the Pope at the time took a strong stance against anything that could be considered witchcraft. 
In 1320, Pope John XXII commissioned a team of theological experts to consider whether certain specific cases of malicious conjuring could be considered heresy. Later, he issued Bull Super Ilius Specula, which is now proclaimed that any magical practices or contacts with demons were by their nature heretical, and therefore came within the competence of inquisitions. The Western Church and its Protestant successors were to initiate more than two centuries of active witch persecution. Not even other Abrahamic religions were safe. As Islam came to Europe, the church decried it as devil worship, and some legal ramifications were had. Parliament briefly imprisoned the English printer of the Quran, while one high church pamphleteer ascribed the work to the devil. Rather paradoxically, since the principal translator appears to have been a former protege of Archbishop Laud, and elsewhere denounced Copernicus, Spinoza, and Descartes. In 1487, the Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of Witches, was written. For 200 years, it would be a bestseller, second only to the Holy Bible itself. It dealt with discerning the nature and operations of witches, as well as the appropriate means of execution for anyone found guilty of witchcraft. Many people died as a result of the church's choice to ban what they considered demonolatry. What's detailed in the Malleus Maleficarum mostly has to do with incubi and succubi, or sex demons. Common occurrences such as wet dreams or unplanned pregnancies were usually attributed to these evil sex demons, and most of the content in the Malleus Maleficarum deals with protecting yourself from these evil nightly visitors. After Christians stopped persecuting witches and punishing them with death, various mystery schools such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn started becoming popular. They taught rituals based on Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism, and various pagan traditions. From the Golden Dawn there came Aleister Crowley who founded Thelema, possibly the most famous occultist in modern history. Crowley's rituals were filled with elaborate costumes and bold claims of working with demons. Some considered him to be a Satanist, which at times he encouraged and at other times discouraged. Figures such as Crowley inspired further reaches into modern demonolatry, with Anton Zandor LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan. 1966 served as year one for the Church of Satan, and by 1969 LaVey had written his own Satanic Bible. The spread of Satanism led to a spark of public outrage and fear. People claimed that music was evil, that Satan had entered every possible kind of media, and many people were claiming that Satanic cults had been kidnapping people, brainwashing them, raping them, and killing them. Luckily, witch burning did not resume, and the public soon began to accept the presence of a Satanic organization. The current head of the Church of Satan is Peter H. Gilmore who doesn't condone any actions of the sort. In fact, in 2007, Gilmore even reported a teenager to the FBI after receiving a letter stating that the teen intended to kill someone in the name of Satan. Today, most bookstores have sections on the occult. Demonic hymns and myths are easy to access, and there's no longer a huge cultural stigma surrounding demonolatry. It appears that the demons have won the culture war. Hopefully you found this video informative. If you did, give us a like, a comment, and if you haven't, subscribed. We've already got 4,000 subscribers, so that's really exciting. Also, if you really like our stuff, you can support us on Patreon. And you can visit our website, milwaukeeatheist.com, if you want to talk on our forum, or if you want to buy any of our merch. Also, check out our Teespring for all sorts of wacky and fun shirts. That's all for now. Bye bye